Star Trek oppresses women. And vandalism by women is a sign of oppression of women. And gender equality apparently helps minorities. A hipster says so, therefore it must be true. Oh, and trucks are inherently oppressive. Inherently oppressive to women, of course. These are our stories on periodic insanity. Hello everyone, and welcome to the fourth episode of Periodic Insanity. Now we'll dedicate this episode entirely to gender insanity, because these stories kept on piling up in my queue in the last month, and making a video about each and one of them is not only harder, but also significantly more complicated given my schedule. So, story number one, coming from Serbia, Blitz.rs, gender equality is important for protection of minorities. Short article, quote, Eva Vukashinovic, Deputy Provincial Ombudsperson for the Protection of the Rights and Minorities in Vojvodina, has stated that the question of gender equality must be recognized as strategically important for protecting the rights of national minorities. She added that national minority councils often apply regulations inconsistently and mentioned that discrepancy between relevant strategies and action plans is a special problem. During the discussion, the participants showed that um, the most interest in including more men in gender equality protecting activities, as well as regulating possibilities and even uh, obligations of national councils to form boards for gender equality as one of their WAG bodies. The seminar was organized by the Women's Support Center from Kikinda, with support from OSCE mission in Serbia. Now, this is Eva Vukashinovic. I mean, you tell me this is not the Big Red of Serbia. I dare you. I mean, just add some problematic glasses on her and, well, there you have it. The reality, though, is that these OSCE missions, which stands for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, these missions are essentially a bunch of losers who have largely never held a real job in their lives, and they pretend to preach from their pedestal to various countries of Europe how they should conduct their affairs. Now, some say they used to have a real-life relevant purpose, particularly in the 90s when war was tormenting the former Yugoslav territories, but I'm not buying that either. The only relevant security-related and cooperation organization in and for Europe is NATO. Everyone else are there solely to spend other people's money on employees who should be cleaning the streets since they rarely have any other noteworthy qualification to speak of. I mean, take this Vukashinovich character, for example. Her work experience in the real world is exactly zero. She worked for the state for her entire life. The Serbian taxpayers paid for her studies at the law school in Novi Sad in order for her to then become the inside bureaucrat who tirelessly works to dismantle Serbia by advocating for more and more separation of the Vojvodina area from the rest of Serbia. She worked as a low-level clerk with the courthouse, got a Soros scholarship uh, to learn Hungarian law, then worked in a central planning commission, and when she finally could do something somewhat useful, like being a judge, she refused the position in favor of a do-nothing anti-national activist position as the deputy provincial ombudsman, a position in which, unlike the one of a judge, she is not really accountable to anyone and pays no penalty for being, well, wrong. Yet for some reason, it is these people, the Eva Vukos Vukashinoviches of the world, who then come around and tell us they're being oppressed. You're being paid a high salary to literally do nothing, you pretentious twat. What more could you possibly want? Man, I'm, I'm telling you, there are a few people that I hate more than these sleazy twats who are employed on taxpayers' dime in a make-work job that 
really shouldn't exist in the first place. <sighs> All right, let's go to the next story. Coming from Germany, from Deutschlandfunk.de, young women keep the police busy. Longish article, but I will read most of it thanks to my co-host over at the AVFM podcast for the translation. So, quote, the parking lot for the cars of the federal police are just a few paces from the tracks of the Kiel Central Station. But this morning the area looks rather empty, a single police car is parked where there should be room for half a dozen. Over the last few weeks, the vehicles have been repeatedly targeted by a group of young women between the ages of 13 and 16. They sliced open tires, scratched windows or smashed the windows outright. They scrolled over the police cars with varnish and left slogans which, to put it mildly, are not exactly flattering to the police. The federal police does not want to talk in the media about the issue, instead referring to the Public Prosecution Office of Kiel, which is in charge of the investigation. Their spokesman, Axel Bieler, calls uh, these acts extraordinary. Quote, While we do know that some of these young women have previous criminal records, most of their pr previous altercations with the law are very recent and targeted at police. This is quite unusual. However, Axel Bieler says it would not be accurate to speak of a girls' gang since, according to the best information available, there isn't any leading personality within the group. Four girls are the central targets of the investigation. The youngest is 13 years of age, the oldest a mere 16. A special age group when it comes to possible sanctions, but also when it comes to motive. On one of the vandalized police cars, the young women left the slogan ACAB, which stands for All Cops Are Bastards. In September, a search of a 16-year-old yielded a list which contained points such as steal, cop car and steal a cop car and wreck it or break in, steal and resist. A particular hatred of the police, some kind of new group against state's power? Not according to senior prosecutor Beeler. Well, we're not quite finished with our investigation, but we've already completely ruled out politically motivated acts. Oh, mach es dir selber! <sighs> really? So you have a bunch of highly entitled, highly violent and highly dangerous young bitches who rally under hardline communist slogans, yet you completely ruled out politically motivated acts? Really? Now I wonder if the attitude would have been the same had it been boys instead of girls, or had they drawn up swastikas or written Wir sind die Zukunft instead of communist slogans. Now I, I somehow doubt this attitude would have been so lenient. But wait, it gets a lot worse. Quote, Yes, this is a case of defamation and criminal property damage, but according to Beeler, this didn't justify massive prosecutorial measures. What is called for instead are measures of support for youths to stab stabilize the teenagers and prevent further criminal offenses. Quote, Maybe we can speak of attention which young people seek, and if they can't get it by normal means, then they resort to criminal crimes to be noticed somehow. After initial talks with youth services, we have to assume that the girls don't have an easy life, so this might well be a cry for help, but possibly it's not. In some cases, violence, drugs and neglect play the role, Beeler explains. What the girls had in common was that they had trouble forming human connections. They lacked faith in adults and were difficult to reach. Beeler thinks that this might explain why they are targeting the police, because they symbolized something. Yes, they symbolized the authority that communists, specifically anarcho-communists, despise. You pretentious cuck. And because the young women knew that the officers wouldn't do anything serious to them. Gee, I wonder where they could get that impression for. I mean, it couldn't possibly be because having a vagina is literally a get-out-of-jail-free get card or something. Anyway, quote, Maybe a no notion of honor was involved here, that they did not want to hurt anyone but play a kind of game of cops and robbers but one in which the stakes are high. It's about attention. What is important, Beeler emphasizes, is to build a connection with the youths to get their attentions um, and show them what they are facing. Skipping a bit. 
So far, there have been several meetings on the subject in which representatives of the youth service, uh, police and prosecution participated. One suggestion which was discussed there was to offer the young women an internship with the police. Uh, <clears throat> How do you say cucked in German? Because there is no other way to describe this prosecutor's attitude other than, well, cucked. How would you describe someone whose property is being damaged and then that someone he offers to employ the criminal, uh, a priori assuming that the criminal didn't really mean to destroy the property? Amazing. Also, these people seem to be under the impression that teenage criminals are idiots. Now, that's a huge mistake that, well, I'm sorry to say that, but women tend to make. Actually, I'm not sorry. Teenage criminals have a lot of attributes, but stupidity isn't one of them. In fact, teenage criminals are usually amongst the, sm the most smart, amongst the smartest folks on the block, especially when it comes to evading the law and getting things done. So, under these circumstances, these cucks' ideas uh, of offering these violent criminals an internship with the police is a golden opportunity for the said criminals to upgrade their knowledge on how the police works these days. Way to go, Bundespolizei, way to go. What irks me the most is the amount of mental gymnastic one must subject oneself through in order to come up with... Uh, such insane ideas, and this is almost exclusively due to feminism and the wider political correctness. I'm pretty sure that the Bundespolizei was far less cucked back in the 80s, and if such a case had emerged during the heyday of the Rote Army Fraktion, I'm pretty sure the cops and the prosecutors would, ha would not have jumped to make excuses for the vandals. But maybe it's just me. Maybe I am too grumpy and the poor little girls are acting out in a radical communist manner because they have a tough life. But if having a tough life is the criterion to excuse criminals and criminal activity, then you have a huge amount of teenage boys and young men to release from prison and give internships with the police. Now, you can't have it both ways. You either care very much about why teenagers commit violent crimes, in which case you have a huge pile of excuses to make for a lot of them, or you're a cynical a-hole like me and uh, you just, you know, lock him up! Either way, this special pleading because vagina is disgusting. It really is. All right. Let's move further down to the epitome of uh, first world problems. Star Trek is oppressive. No, seriously, there's a study about it. Coming from Quartz, which has become lately my go-to source for feminist drivel and anti-white cancer, a new study shows how Star Trek jokes and geek culture make women feel unwelcome in computer science. And goes like this, quote, as a high school sophomore in the 1990s, I took a mandatory computer science class that had a reputation for being difficult. The word among girls was that the only students who did well in the course were the Dungeons and Dragons boys. A very nice teacher taught the class, but he often reinforced this male-oriented image of who could be successful with nerdy Star Trek jokes and other pop culture references more likely to resonate with boys than girls. Unsurprisingly, boys dominated classroom interactions, answered questions confidently, and turned in their tests quickly. Many of those boys went on to become a computer scientists and engineers, whilst girls largely turned to fields like social sciences, medicine, and business. The same dynamic persists on a broad scale across the United States. Although women have made great strides in STEM fields like biology, chemistry, and mathematics, a large gender gap persists in computer science as well as in engineering and physics. In fact, just 18% of undergraduate degrees in the subject go to women today, down from 29% back when I was in college. 
which should be evidence that women uh, have it all. They make more sex-specific choices, not less when they have it. After all, women in Iran and India go to STEM a lot more than women in Sweden. But don't tell that to the feminists, they'll accuse you of wrong thing. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> I mean misogyny. Anyway, let's hear the study. Quote, a recent psychological study I conducted with my colleagues, uh, published uh, this month in the Psychological Bulletin, has a clear message about our best hope for diversifying computer science. To draw more girls into STEM fields, it's not enough to provide more learning opportunities. The cultures in these fields need to change to communicate to girls that they belong in them just as much as boys do. Now, before going further, I, I really need to ask, now, why would you want to diversify computer science? I mean, I know I wouldn't. Computer science has been serving humanity very well so far, as undiverse as possible. So maybe, just maybe, if it ain't broken, don't try to fix it? Nah, who am I kidding? This is Marxism feminism we're talking about here. Diversity is mandatory, even if women don't want it. Anyway, let's read how the study worked out. Quote, we analyzed over 1,000 research articles to de determine what distinguishes the more gender-balanced fields, like biology, chemistry and math, from computer science, engineering and physics, which have greater gender disparities. We found that the difference comes down to culture. Computer science, engineering and uh, physics have more masculine cultures than biology, chemistry and mathematics, and that these masculine cultures are turning women away. Specific factors include male-oriented stereotypes about the people in the fields, stereotypes that women have lower abilities, and a certain dearth of female role models. When courses are optional, as is typical for computer science, students rely on their stereotypes about the fields to decide whether to enroll. And as one undergraduate research participant in our lab put it, the current stereotypes of computer science scientists is that they are nerdy guys who stay up late coding and drinking energy drinks and have no social life. Well, the stereotype is there for a reason for crying out loud. I mean, seriously, the overwhelming majority of stereotypes about anything, really, do contain a rather huge grain of truth in them. I mean, that's why they exist, because a sufficient number of people over a long period of time have observed the exact same phenomenon. Amazing. I mean, really... Whining about stereotypes is, in most cases, literally whining about reality. I mean, yes, most computer scientists are nerdy guys who stay up late coding and drinking energy drinks, or coffee, and have little to no social life. I mean, that's just a fact. And if you're put off by that, then, well, you have bigger issues. And it does speak volumes of the way men and women function. You don't hear linguists or translators whining that they can't become experts in their field because of the stereotype of their profession is spoiled girls, mostly slutty, who largely talk about degenerate girly nonsense. I mean, heck, when I was in college, <laughs> the place where I, was, uh, where, where I was studying was called the brothel between the trees, because 80% of the students were women, most of them on the whore side of the spectrum, and the building was in the middle of a superb park with very tall and old trees. Yet for some reason, that didn't prevent me from learning what I was there to learn to begin with. Neither was any of my male colleagues, as few as they were. Anyway, let's read further, quote, This geeky image is at odds with the way that uh, many girls see themselves. Well, tough luck, methinks. Work from our lab shows that when high school girls see Star Trek posters and video games in a computer science classroom, they are less interested than boys in taking the course. When the classroom is devoid of decor, girls still opt out. 
It is only when an alternate image of computer science is presented by replacing geeky, geeky objects with art and nature posters that girls become as interested as boys. All this matters a great deal, because optional courses not only reinforce current gender divides, they magnify them. Because boys are more likely to opt in to pre-college experiences with computer science when they, go, uh, when they get to college, they dominate introductory courses. Girls who come in without the same knowledge tend to believe they are worse at computer science and not cut out for the field. Well, that's because they objectively are worse at computer science. You see, regular girls just aren't stupid, and certainly are far smarter than your average feminist. I mean, they get in there without the same knowledge as their peers, so they correctly identify that they are worse at that topic. So, if anything, they should be praised for collectly correctly identifying reality, rather than pe be pampered with disdainful excuses like these ones. I mean, these feminists want us to be genuinely believe that the reason some girls know objectively less when they go into college in a computer science class is because they weren't enough, there weren't enough fluffy decorations in the computer science labs in high schools. Come on, really? I mean, how much of a misogynist you would have to be to believe that young women in their late high school years are so bloody fragile and stupid that they can't do proper computer science without fluffy decorations. You know, I keep saying this and I'll hammer it for as long as I'm alive. The most misogynistic view of women that exists right now is the feminist view of women. I mean, even Islam regards women with slightly more respect, as evidenced by the fact that one of the highest female-to-male ratio of university students is recorded in the Islamic Republic of Iran. I mean, sure, Islam is awful, but feminism is cancer. Anyway, let's read further. Quote, the research is clear on what works to encourage more girls to choose computer science. Change the masculine culture. Changing the stereotypes by diversifying computer science environments is one way to reduce gender ga gaps. Oh, for God's sake! You know, I'm trying. I'm trying really hard not to curse for the entirety of this video. I'm really trying not to just call them degenerate fucktards and move on to the next story. I really am, and it's just hard, it really is. How else should I react when these highly cancerous ideologues not only promote outright misogyny, but they also attempt to erode one of the pillars of modern civilization, and in the process discounting the intelligence of both men and women? Have these freaks even considered that the women who already are in the field are there precisely because they like the masculine environment? Well, of course they haven't. I mean, after all, thinking is patriarchal, and we can't have that, right, feminists? Look, there is such thing as fields that simply do cater to one sex better than the other. That's why women in biology have been around since long before the so-called women's liberation, because biology is a field that caters to women slightly more. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's interesting that these are uh, the same people who profess to believe in diversity and claim that diversity is our strength, yet when faced with actual evidence of diversity being a strength and a bringer of cooperation, namely that women do very fine in biology using technology created by the men in computer science, they want to change it. Science is not a democracy, for crying out loud. Not everyone has to be represented. Everyone is invited to compete, but most have to and will fail. That's just the nature of the beast. Anyway, final paragraphs. Quote, 
Our research has found that college women have a two-minute interaction with a computer science major played by student actors who wear t-shirts that say I code, therefore I am, and identify Mystery Science Theater 3000 as their favorite show, express less interest in majoring in computer science than college women who interact with the same students wearing regular t-shirts and watching The Office instead. Who the hell watches The Office? So now computer science guys need to watch boring shows in the name of sexual diversity? Anyway, computer science teachers who showcase the ways in which their personalities and interests are broader than the narrow stereotypes may have an easier time convincing girls to follow in their footsteps. Culture change isn't always easy, but it is always possible. The University of Washington's Computer Science Department has been working hard for the past decade to create a more inclusive culture for women. The department added art and nature posters throughout their building to make it more inviting. Women were appointed as teaching assistants in many courses. Professors sent personalized emails recognizing women who received high grades in introductory courses. These emails define success as getting good grades rather than whether one plays video games or knows science fiction references. The efforts have indeed paid off. Last year, the proportion of undergraduate computer science degrees going to women at the University of Washington, 32%, was higher than any other public flagship university in the country. The gender g uh, gap began to close once women could learn computer science in a culture that signaled they belonged. It's time we take the pressure off women to change themselves to fit within masculine cultures. Instead, the pressure should be on society to make computer science a field in which all students feel equally welcome. You know, sometimes... A free helicopter ride is necessary. Not literally, but figuratively. I mean, seriously, just purge all these idiots from the academe, if there is to be a civilization for our grandchildren. Also, notice the neat rhetorical trick to avoid appearing too misandric. The pressure should be on society to make computer science more inclusive or whatever. Heck, even leftists who actually believe this kind of drivel have noticed that the proposal in this article is bloody insane. Now, I will leave a link in the low bar with the thread in the description for you to read. All right. Let's go to the final story. Oh boy, this video has gotten quite long. Anyway, coming from Jotteborg's Posten from Sweden. The gender researcher who became a truck engineer short article, so let's read. Quote, A gender researcher at Örebro Universitet received 2.5 million svenske kroner, that is 250,000 euros, in state grants for constructing trucks for women. This is thanks to the government authority Vinova. The Sweden, uh, in Sweden, the government's norm criticism received almost sacred status. Being antisocial has become the primary goal. The standards must be broken and why must one do that has become secondary. Now, a gender researcher at Örebro University received 2.5 million svenske kroner in state grants for constructing trucks for women. This is thanks to the government authority Vinova. The agency has a whole program to reward quote-unquote gender equality. The transport industry has traditionally been designed by men for men. Today, there is an increased interest from women to enter the industry, but the truck is sometimes a barrier, says project manager Doug Balkmar, research in gender studies at Erebo University in a press release. We are going to understand that the transport uh, sector is male-dominated because it is men who have designed the trucks. As if all of that will be used by um, the women workers must have been designed by other women in order for it to be functional. This way of looking at different phenomena is typical of the standard critical wave that has swept across Sweden. And it's not uh, just when it comes to sex that they argue this way. The same rationale is applied in terms of ethnicity, disability and sexuality. Everything must be rethought. Vinova is just one of several agencies that have embraced uncritically the ideology of norm criticism. 
Earlier this week, the Swedish tax authority invited the activist gender photographer to educate employees about the, the standard critical communications. As if that were enough, they also voluntarily donated their Twitter account to spread his message, which included that the man and the male is the norm. One may object to the message itself that the man is always the norm has uh, <clears throat> become a general truth, but how true is it? Above all, one should ask why the tax agency disseminates this. In what way is it compatible with the agency's mission? It is noteworthy that the gender scientific theories had such an impact when they are anything but scientific. Certainly, there are differences between men and women. Some are biological, others socially constructed. The problem lies not in that research uh, is conducted about this, but in the so-called research that tends to be guided by ideological beliefs. Almost exclusively, biological factors are brushed off and instead are attributed excessively to social construction. Further on, each difference tends to be regarded as a sign of an underlying oppressive structure as is the case of the pesky antisocial trucks. With this, the question of equality is reduced to a question of representation. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> while in the United States the universities are paying shekels for feminists to complain that there aren't enough fluffy decorations in uh, computer science labs, a fact which allegedly drives women away from the field, in Sweden the government is paying shekels for feminists to pretend that they're engineers. <laughs> Amazing. Now, mind you, this is a country that spent a tremendous amount of taxpayer shekels to get more women to become truck drivers. The result? Well, the proportion of, the proportion of women uh, uh, truck drivers rose from 3.6% uh, to 4%. Outstanding! Meanwhile, the United States, which has zero public support of any kind in the profession, let alone disdainful nonsense like powering taxpayers' money into getting women in, has 5.6% of its truck drivers female. Japan is at 10%, also with no tax shekels was wasted on uh, and no gender researchers to bitch and complain. You know, just markets at work and individuals responding to incentives. Now, in the case of Japan, the chronic labor shortage is the incentive. But the broader issue is this assumption that there is a need for more women to become truck drivers. Now, mind you, I have an old neighbor lady who used to be a truck driver. She's 85 now. She was a truck driver from the 50s and way into the 1980s and in communism. You know, how, you, you know what she tells me when uh, we talk about this? That it was the worst period of her life. She thanked heavens that communism fell and that she could choose, even if older, to pursue something else under capitalism. You see, back in communism, the ideology of absolute equality of outcome was quasi-mandatory. The results were terrible, but hey, at least we had equality. The reality is that, left to their own devices, in a prosperous society, women will not choose to go in droves into truck driving, or computer science, or oil rigs, or any other of these um, very hard fields. Sure, occasionally, here and there, you'll have the token exception, and that's fine, but by and large, such variations per profession are perfectly healthy and normal. And the more prosperous an economy gets, the more strident the variations will be. That's why there are more women in STEM in India than in Sweden, or more women in colleges in Iran than in Norway. It's not because there is a high degree of women's liberation in the, latter, uh, in, the, in the former countries, it's because the economy is not yet prosperous enough for the women in the latter countries to afford the luxury of pursuing less profitable but far more appealing careers. After all, in Sweden, even as a social worker you will still make a far better living than engineers in Iran. 
Hence, most social workers in Sweden are women because it's a highly appealing field and while not very rewarding financially, the overall level of prosperity still makes that small reward quite a good one. Basically, even the poor under capitalism fare better than the middle class under socialism. And mind you, Sweden has been drifting quite a lot from capitalism. That's why even the upper middle class in Sweden is still poorer than the top 2% of Americans. The top 2% poorest Americans, that is. Who have far more living space than the upper middle class in Sweden. And also have more electric and electronic appliances and far more likely, are far more likely to own at least one automobile. So in light of these facts, the pursuit of gender diversity is silly at best and dangerous at worst. Women in Europe, or in the West, have never lived a better in the entire history of mankind. Do we hear any cheers for that? Do we get a thank you to capitalism and, well, to the men who actually made this possible? No. Instead we get scorn, lamenting and perpetual whining. And that is why feminism is cancer. It's never enough, because feminism never was about improving the lot of women. That was the job of capitalism. Feminism is about making men as miserable as the feminists are. And they will succeed if not enough normal people stand up to them and tell them to just get out of the way. Anyway, with all of that being said, this concludes the fourth episode of Periodic Insanity. Thank you all for watching, thank you for your continuous support of the channel, and um, I guess I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative. <laughs>